and I, the recording just started. Welcome everybody. My name is Carrie Leach and I am a research assistant professor at Wayne State University in Detroit and um, really passionate about, uh, passionate about community engaged research. I'm very excited that this interest group has um, begun at uh, GSA and uh, I'm very excited about our speakers and moderator here today. Um, if you are not a member of our community engaged research interest group through um, GSA, you can um, join virtually. Um, and I'll make some announcements at the end of this about um, our next series of um, journal clubs and peer mentoring space and what we're gonna offer over the summer. Um, uh, on behalf of our interest group, which is our community engaged research interest group. Um, and as a small working group, as we planned um, this year's activities, um, this is a kind of our jumping off point. We started the interest group with listening sessions and hearing what people really needed as a new interest group. And uh, so this is our jumping off point. Um, we have the title of our um, presentation today is Community Engaged Research in Low Income uh, Context. And we are going to have uh, two speakers today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Morrison and Dr. Suda will be our speakers and they're gonna give us an overview of uh, their projects. And then we'll also hear from uh, Jenny Konkin um, and she's at Hallway House and she has lots of great information that we can all benefit hearing about um, and uh, we have a moderator. I'm just the host today, welcoming everybody. And I'll be talking a little bit about our uh, community engaged research interest group at the end. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to our uh, moderator, Dr. Tatiana Shippey. Uh, we're so glad that she was able to be here um, and that you all uh, were able to attend. And just so you know, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. As we go forward, um, Tatiana, you can see the chat and kind of get a visual for Q&A. So, so we've been prepped for the last 30 minutes and we feel ready and confident to go. Um, if you have questions, please enter them and we have support. So if you're having some kind of technical difficulties, please let us know that too. And uh, uh, thank you for being here and I will turn it over to Dr. Shippey and thank you for moderating today. Thank you, Carrie. Well, in fact, my understanding is that we will have our first speaker, Jenny, who will present for about 15 minutes, and then Dr. Suda and Morrison will present next. So, Jenny, I'm going to hand it off to you then. All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Jenny. I'm the president and co-founder of Holway House Society uh, here in Vancouver, BC, Canada. And we serve low-income seniors and veterans and vulnerable residents uh, in the downtown east side, as well as across um, our city and expanding across the province now. Uh, and I just want to share a little bit about what our community-based programs do. So I'm going to share my screen uh, to give a little bit of a visual. I'm really honored to be here uh, such among such great speakers and um, people who care about what I'm passionate about, which is um, helping seniors and older adults um, age well in place and have um, dignified housing so that they can um, just age well and enhanced uh, life. So we work with um, seniors who have experienced homelessness or who are at severe risk of homelessness. The downtown east side of Vancouver is the poorest postal code in Canada, uh, and it is right next to one of the wealthiest postal codes uh, for sure in Vancouver, and if not in Canada. Uh, so there's quite the um, clashing in our city of homelessness and wealth, um, which I'm sure is in many cities, um, but it is quite unique in Vancouver where it is very evident out in the streets of open drug use, um, violence, uh, abuse, and uh, many other things that can make seniors and older adults vulnerable. So we do supportive housing services, partnering with landlords of nonprofit housing. Um, in Vancouver and in Canada, currently seniors are um, being lumped into uh, shelter systems with um, adults and, and adolescents, and they 
also will be put into supportive housing sites, which are intended for people with addiction and mental health issues uh, to have 24 hour supports. However, their needs are different. So we're seeing a major issue with that. Um, they are the fastest rising uh, demographic in our homeless population in Metro Vancouver. Uh, currently 24% of our homeless population are seniors over the age of 55. Uh, in Vancouver, so I should clarify, in Vancouver uh, for the downtown east side, we classify a senior as 55 plus, and that is actually being looked at right now to, um, to be lowered to 50 because of the um, lifestyle and types of issues they've faced, uh, obviously aged faster. Um, our housing operators in nonprofit housing are extremely concerned because they are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They're operating independent housing, and as seniors are aging, they're becoming less and less independent, but they don't have the appropriate uh, support services in place to help them remain housed. And so we're seeing a major gap in our province for this. And of course, um, COVID has only exacerbated um, the isolation, the loneliness, the lack of uh, support services for them. Um, so we are a registered charity and we partner with these are landlords in our city uh, of nonprofit housing. And we were originally um, started, my brother and I started because we were operating a single room occupancy building in Vancouver, which housed um, adults who were, um, have experienced homelessness, often coming out of prison, shelters, the streets, um, and and we recognized that the issues that they were facing were not only poverty and mental health and addiction, but it was actually isolation. And that was the core of the issues that they were facing. Um, and so we started our programs, which I'll share a little bit about what we do. Um, but the first thing that we needed to do was reconnect. And we see this now that we're into seniors housing, the exact same issue was the issue of isolation. And um, living in the defense mode and protection mode uh, because of the neighborhood that they're living in, force that isolation because it was safer than than connecting with people which made them very vulnerable and so our our three r's are reconnect rebuild and recenter and the reconnect is really just creating a place where people can connect together in a safe and healthy environment so we do programs like family dinners and games nights and um and coffee clubs in the morning and super smoothies because i'm always trying to get spinach and healthy food into people um and that's a great way to do it and then the second issue that we saw was a lack of a sense of purpose and self-worth um, because they didn't have opportunities to contribute or to learn or to um, feel successful. And so we created programs that help to rebuild that sense of um, value. So whether it's taking a workshop or a class or um, doing a cooking class together or having, um, having them volunteer that value and purpose. And then the recenter was really because there was a lack of a one on one support system um, for people who are living in in these nonprofit housing buildings in poverty coming out of shelters, uh, their support system wasn't healthy. And so we individualize our support system with tenant support services. So whatever that next step might be, they have somebody to walk alongside them um, and give them the tools that they might need to move forward. In Vancouver, um, our, as I said, seniors are our fastest rising homeless population. Our most recent actually is 2021 just came out uh, is still 24% of our homeless population. We have a very large homeless population. Um, you might imagine something like uh, downtown Los Angeles with tent cities, uh, very similar, but very concentrated. And um, obviously we're just scraping the surface of the baby boomers. And so this is only going to continue to increase. People often ask me, why are seniors becoming homeless? And some of the reasons that we see are things like unpaid rent um, due to memory loss, accessibility to the bank, um, being scammed, uh, taken advantage of. And then of course, affordability in Vancouver, we uh, I believe are the now the second most expensive city um, to live in. Uh, home cleanliness and hoarding often can become uh, an issue in terms of pests, rodents, and for landlords uh, needing to evict. And lack of food security, personal hygiene, all these things that we start to see decline uh, can lead to that uh, vulnerability of being evicted or losing their housing. And so we provide services that counteract each of these things. So um, getting them involved in social activities, keeping them active, 
also helps us to stay engaged to see when they might need those support services and step in and offer our help uh, so that we're able to prevent uh, eviction. And um, the other one that we uh, that is becoming more and more common is extended hospital stays and having nobody to coordinate their rent payment. Uh, so somebody's in the hospital for three or four months, the landlord doesn't even know where they are because uh, they're living in independent housing and the rent goes unpaid. So we're able to step in there as well. Uh, just an overview of our programs that we created programs as we got to know seniors more and more over the last uh, seven years of you know, being in seniors housing. And one of the things that we saw that was different um, when we transitioned from adults to, to older adults was um, a higher sense of pride or um, hesitation to receive our services, um, not wanting to have charity or seem dependent or even seem vulnerable as they might um, that make they would think that might make them more vulnerable to being evicted uh, by their landlord. And so we had to get creative in how to make someone feel uh, still very dignified and be able to access these services. So I'm going to highlight our free shopping program. Um, we'll often have gentlemen coming in, as I said, from shelters, from, from homelessness, um, and they wouldn't accept free clothing or, or things that they might need for their home, like pots and pans. And so we developed a free shopping program. We often get donations of clothing and we set up our lobby to look like a little retail store and they can come down and they get um, for example, eight tokens, uh, the tokens are free, um, but then they go around and they choose the items that they want and it's one token per item. Uh, and there's this sense of shopping, there's a sense of autonomy, I'm choosing what I want, I'm choosing the sweater that I like, uh, the new pants that I need. And, um, and then there's a form of exchange of payment. And so when they when they're finished shopping, and we've been able to assist them and help them. Um, and so that has been something that we've really learned uh, with older adults, how to help them access services that are available to them, um, but in a way that's actually dignified for them and that they will utilize those services. So that's just one small example of something that we saw where they weren't accessing services in the community um, because they felt it would be like receiving charity or becoming dependent. Uh, we do a lot of medical coordination with our healthcare system. A big gap for us is between housing and health, uh, which I'm sure is across America as well, where um, the if they're not accessing their health services, it really has an impact on their housing. Um, and so we really um, coordinate that for them, reminding them to go to their doctor's appointments or um, letting them know what they what they actually have access to. For example, home support services, having a carry come to their home uh, to ensure that they're uh, receiving their medication or their bathing, those types of things. So uh, they don't, they might not have been aware that they have access to those things. This is a photo of our free shopping program. Uh, so we set up the lobby, as I said, they can go around, choose their things, be autonomous in their selection, uh, and also just have a lot of fun with our staff as well. This is our seated exercise program. Uh, some of our community building happens here as well. Uh, so we host seated exercise multiple times per week, but just getting people out and active, taking them on outings, uh, which has been really, really helpful to keep them engaged. Uh, and again, that helps us to um, see when someone might be declining and intervene to offer our services in other areas. Since starting our programs uh, and partnering with landlords, we've seen a 97% retention rate when bringing seniors in from homelessness. One of the biggest issues that we saw um, in Vancouver is that we spend a lot of money on helping people get housed, uh, but they don't stay housed. And so there's a, um, a lot of turnover in the buildings. There's a lot of um, going back to either because they're being evicted because they don't have the skills or the tools to remain housed successfully, or they're used to being transient and moving because there's no sense of connection and belonging. And so once we were able to create that sense of belonging and housing, we saw that coming out of homelessness, we were able to help people stabilize, and especially seniors have that sense of belonging in home, um, that they're able to feel safe here, and they can actually stay, um, versus moving around from shelter to shelter, or inappropriate housing to inappropriate housing, which is usually the case in Vancouver. Um, some of the buildings that we see a lot of seniors living in are over 100 years old, they don't have elevators, um, they're quite decrepit, they used to be hotels um, for for people working down in our docks and our ports. Um, and so they just became these single room buildings and they're really inappropriate. And so um, we were really excited to partner with our provincial government on this because we saw stabilization. And, um, and this was another big gap that we weren't able to identify in, 
in there's no research about this about why are people going back why are people becoming homeless again and so we were able, able to provide some of our stats and our data to show that once people were engaged in what might look like social programs um, it actually helped the retention rate in their housing because they had a sense of belonging and a sense of home so we couldn't look at it just in they need food or they need um you know nursing services they needed sense of belonging in order to make this full picture uh, come together. Um, I won't share too much about some of our success stories, but I just want to point out Tibor in the corner there sitting with me. Um, he was living in one of those buildings. Um, often there's a lot of gang members, a lot of um, illegal activity happening in those buildings. And so he he was living in one of those buildings. I found him in a snowstorm. I was driving home from work and I saw him pushing his walker down the street and I I couldn't believe we don't get a lot of snow in Vancouver. We're definitely babies about it. The city shuts down when we get, you know, one inch of snow. And but he's sliding down the road. He's wearing that leather jacket, no toque, no mittens uh, in one of the worst snowstorms we've ever seen. And so I kept telling myself, Jenny, don't pick up strangers, don't pick up strangers. And of course, I find myself turning my car around and picking up a stranger saying, where are you going? And I got him into my car. He was so scared. He was shaking and he'd gotten on the wrong bus. Uh, he was trying to go to the grocery store and he was very disoriented and didn't know where he was. He shared with me where he was living and I knew that building had had four stabbings in the previous year. I couldn't believe that a man of his age was living there. He was being um, victimized where they were taking his pension every month to pay for protection uh, and just leaving him with very little to buy food. And so um, we were able to move him out and into our building at the Veterans Manor. Uh, he had lost all of his home support services. He's had a stroke. You can see his arm. Uh, most, he has very little use of his left side. I don't know how he was even dressing himself, let alone getting up and down stairs. But uh, we were able to reinstate his home support services. So he has um, bathing meal services and his medication support. Um, and now is living so like just so incredibly and so happy to be there. Uh, and we'll be able to keep him there as long as possible, as long as he's able. So just great to see how we're able to help someone age well in place uh, when they have the appropriate supports in place. During the pandemic, we started a meal delivery program because we were being told to self-isolate, which goes against every grain of my body. Uh, my entire purpose of my organization is to bring people out of isolation and connection. So we had to get very creative with our meal program. Um, so when we delivered meals twice a week, um, we, we were in 19 buildings delivering to over 700 seniors. Um, and that I trained my staff. I said, we are not a you know, a DoorDash or an Uber Eats, we are here to make connections. So asking people how they're doing, checking in on them, and we were able to deliver over 600, uh, 260,000 meals uh, over that period of time, but making those connections. So the purpose of our programs really is to bring seniors together, help have that connection. One area I will just put out to you uh, where we are trying to create more data, but it is very difficult, um, is how to show how social connection and, and healthy support creates stability and health. Um, we have shorter hospital stays as well as um, we're able to prevent going back to the hospital unnecessarily uh, because they have because they have services in place of support and and i'll just emphasize it really is almost like family services um, many of our residents have no family connections and so um, for a variety of reasons whether it's mental illness or um or being newcomers to canada um a variety of things and so uh, we act almost, I step in, I often say to my staff, you know, you're almost like a grandchild who would step in and say, I've noticed these changes in, in this person and a person that I know really well, my grandparent. Um, and so we're able to step in and do that, but in a housing setting. So uh, that's where I'll stop uh, sharing, but I wanted to just say thank you for having me and I'm excited to hear um, the other speakers as well. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. Um, that's amazing work. You're a uh, person-centered approach to support and care and services is, is really exciting to hear about. And thanks for adding that um, kind of like uh, data point that you're struggling with so everybody can hear um, the kind of um, issues you have related to research. Um, okay, and I'm now going to turn it over to um, Suda and to Sharon. Thank you for uh, being with us today. Hey, um, hey everybody and Thank you for joining us today. I'm just getting the slideshow up. And Sharon, you can begin. 
Okay. We put a quote up there just for you to ruminate on, just to think about as we launch into our presentation. Older persons form about 4% of the global refugee stream. In fact, the UNHCR, the UNHCR has emphasized that older refugees should not be seen as the passive recipients of assistance, but as resourceful survivors and repositories of cultural and practical wisdom. Where is my arrow? Oh gosh, where's my next arrow? Oops, there it is, okay. Our presentation is on community-engaged research in low-income contexts, specifically among older refugees in North Carolina. Refugee communities tend to experience lower socioeconomic status and older refugees have additional disadvantage. Community-engaged research and community-based participatory research or CBPR are emancipatory approaches to engaging communities in research, otherwise directed by academics. I wanna thank the organizers for the opportunity to share our work, to share our perspective and experiences that may serve as examples for working with diverse minority and low-income communities. And our context will be Greensboro, North Carolina, a city of over just of over 300,000 individuals, but is a well known refugee resettlement site and a secondary migration um, location. We will briefly talk about ourselves, some relevant concepts and brief descriptions, examples from our work, and resources. I joined UNC Greensboro in 2001, the same year as Sharon, and shortly thereafter, we started collaborating. I was drawn to CBPR approaches because, first, the research questions in communities I was interested in were not reflected in conventional data sets. And second, because for conducting research with marginalized communities, the CBPR approach seems the most positive framework. Sharon and I collaborate in our research on the family context of health. As a public health educator with training in medical anthropology, but also as an, with an immigrant background, I spent the greater part of my career, um, at, particularly at this institution, focused on immigrant and refugee integration and health issues. Coming from a global to local perspective, I use ethnographic field methods and community-based participatory research approaches to uncover what I consider are cultural nuances and to engage those most impacted in the discovery and response to things like disease prevention and health promotion, especially in times like COVID. So since most of this group, I'm assuming is familiar with community-based participatory research or CBPR, we'll touch only briefly on some of the key areas of the CBPR approaches and things that we've had to draw. And so it's important to look at, for us, when we're doing this work, the what, the who, the how, and the why. So in terms of the what, CBPR comes under the umbrella of community, a broad spectrum of community engaging approaches. And they're known by many names. Some people call them participatory action research or action research, community-based research, community-based action research. But that's the what that we're looking at, particularly in public health. The who, Community refers to the complex, to complex dynamic systems, organizations, leaders, formal and informal groups, professionals, government agencies, the development in particular for us, we've worked with the development of community advisory councils or advisory boards that because they have emerged as a key development in the community capacity building in recent years, following the model of the Native American tribal councils. These boards are intermediaries between researchers and communities, protect the interests of communities and ensure that research projects address the community priorities, community's priorities. The how, at every stage, community, re uh, community researchers aim for equal or complementary partnership. Their voices are centered and the benefits are um, mutual for both sides. Community has agency to decide which parts they want to play a role in. And this plays out in the work that we do and continue to do. Finally, the why. 
community engagement or CBPR approaches are promising and responsive for addressing a big ticket item, which is health equity. Gerontology is a very broad field, and there are large numbers of articles published each year based on CBPR projects. However, I was not able to find any broad reviews of the use of community engaged or CBPR methods in gerontology. So general principles at bare repetition here include that community co-researchers promote advocacy and expertise by experience of older adults lends itself to the gerontological lens. In gerontology related CBPR, there can sometimes be triangular relationships among the researcher, the organization or entity serving older adults and the older adults themselves. But absent a review, it's not clear how often older persons are included or excluded from the pro process, especially those experiencing disadvantages. A recent meta review of CBPR by Ortiz et al. highlighted some important aspects of CBPR for health related research. This review highlighted four areas. First, the research contexts. Second, the participatory processes. Third, the intervention and research designs are outputs of research. And four, the health outcomes. Now, this graphic is a presentation, this graphic representation shows the spectrum of the community engaged research within communities, with community members being from one end passive participants on the left and being research partners with equal voice on the right. Very important, particularly if you're working from the academic institution perspective and trying to get a handle on what this means, your, your role is in this process. Kwan and Walsh describe CBPR as emphasizing community as a unit of identity, an approach for vulnerable and marginalized, collaboration and equal partnership throughout the entire process, and an emergent, flexible, iterative process. The pro research process is geared towards social action. Now, the ethical and practical questions do emerge when we do this kind of research and in this space, including to what extent the community will benefit and how these are, are um, and what kinds of products come out, including research projects, how, what emerge and how are these disseminated? Are the, you know, for example, publishing in open access versus paywall journals, community presentations versus these professional conferences or talks, and then data sharing. Big question that comes up, who does this data belong to? What does the community own versus the academics? What do we own? And also how funds are shared. Are shared, how we share resources. Mm -hmm. So this graphic is from the National Academy of Medicine and it shows the principles of community engaged research. It's quite a busy graphic, but if, as when you look, the blue ovals outside the center circles show advantages that arise from community engaged approaches. The outermost dark blue oval emphasizes the ultimate goal of the approach, which is to transform systems and society bending the arts to what we all know as and should champion, which is social justice. We will briefly describe three CBPR projects we have conducted over the last 10 years, highlighting the approaches rather than the results. These projects are first, the Montagnard Hypertension Research Project from 2012 through 2018, the Elder Abuse and Neglect in Two Refugee Communities Project of 2019, and the needs assessment of refugee older adults from 2019 through 2022. So I'm going to start with the Montagnard Hypertension Project. And while my colleague will go into more detail about who Montagnards are, North Carolina is home to the largest population of Montagnards in the world. These Montagnards are a unique community, tribal community. Uh, multi-tribal community from the highlands of Vietnam who were resettled as refugees to this state in the 1980s. And they have been here 30 plus years, but their outcomes resemble or are worse than newly arrived refugees. 
So this project is a, is a result of a call and answer response that developed into a fruitful and longstanding partnership within the context of historical, cultural, and social marginalization. In 2011, in response to concerns about the health and financial toll of a chronic illness, such as hypertension, UNCG researchers were called upon by former Montagnier doctors who could no longer practice, but still serve their communities in various ways and community elders to engage with them in a discovery process to identify and begin to appropriately address this condition and its complex dynamics. Thus ensued two years of mobilization, gatherings, agenda negotiations, mutual education, oral statements, agreements, logical action steps, timelines and deliverables, determined and regulated participation or non-participation. We collaboratively launched a robust investigation represented here in the graphics with the stages and the kinds of individuals we had at the table. Um, that saw subsectors of the older adult population, which means the tribal elders, the pastors, the grandmothers, the practitioners of tribal language, and those that are keepers of cultural arts, working alongside a variety of college youth, including their own, <clears throat> and advocates to capture much needed data through traditional field research mechanisms. That includes focus groups, participatory action work, biologic, collecting biological specimens, and doing survey administration. This yielded findings with implication for much needed health education about hypertension and its management or its origins. It also yielded household, the need for household blood pressure monitoring and referral and a need for increased access to follow up primary health care. But also it had a big reciprocity component that manifests as improved community university relations, youth development, intergenerational conflict transformation and community capacity to now address the insidious, insidious underlying chronic conditions that require targeted attention and sustainable solutions. And we see this playing out right now as we look at COVID-19 and the response by this community to COVID-19. All right, the project on elder abuse and neglect engaged with two refugee communities, the Nepali speaking Bhutanese and the Congolese. This collaboration was between the Institute for Peace and Harmony, which is a nonprofit that assists refugees resettled in Greensboro. Second, UNCG researchers. And third, with Kiran Inc., a nonprofit that provides free family violence and crisis services to people with ties to the Asian community. IPH leadership had been approached by community members with accounts of possible EAN that elder abuse and neglect occurring. So the IPH leadership approached us for technical assistance. Data collection was facilitated by community leaders of each group. To build community capacity, we partnered with Kiran Inc. to deliver an EAN awareness and education event to the community. It turned out that this DV agency themselves had little prior experience with EAN. So in producing this event, their capacity was also enhanced. Now here's the thing, although refugees have been resettling in North Carolina for decades and the state is considered a new gateway state for immigrants, there has never been a needs assessment conducted for older refugees in the state. We examined the Montagnards just described by Sharon and they are a long resettled refugee group since the 1970s with people arriving since then and the younger generation rising up. We also examined two recently arrived communities, the Congolese and the Nepali speaking Bhutanese. The project was generated by interest from the refugee serving community organizations. First, the Montagnard Dega Association slash Montagnard American Organization that was formed to serve the Montagnard community in North Carolina. Second, UNCG's Center for New North Carolinians. And third, the Institute for Peace and Harmony. The CBPR collaboration was a process of consultation, collaboration, dissemination, and capacity building. Out of all the myriad ways of capacity building, 
we will mention youth leadership development as a key aspect of community capacity building and addressing intergenerational gaps in the community. Students from the community were key members of our research team and acted as cultural bridges. This experience built the students' professional development and transformed intergenerational gaps into mutually supportive relationships and recentered older generations' cultural contributions and wisdom. We should mention that all these communities are very low socioeconomic status and low resource, and we've had to be very creative in how we partner and use almost non-existent resources to uh, conduct our work. So in ending, we want to use leave you with three main points that we sort of coalesce around. That this community engagement is a practical and feasible approach to research with diverse immigrant and refugee populations, with particularly low resource community um, communities. Older refugee adults are an unprioritized segment uh, of our population in North Carolina. And then CBPR as a community engagement approach is action oriented. It's flexible, it promotes collaborative response, empowerment for health and well being of older refugee adults in low resource settings. Okay, this year we are honoring the memory of people who have left us. On the left is Dr. Kay Loveless, formerly faculty in the Department of Public Health Education of UNC Greensboro. She was passionate about photography and took humane and beautiful portraits of refugees in Greensboro. On the right are my parents and my father passed away in January of this year. And our parents raised a family to appreciate nature, arts, science, intellectual curiosity, and a zest for life. We do invite you to ask questions. And while you are formulating your questions, we will be happy to share these resources with whoever is interested in this group. And we draw your attention in particular to UNCG Center for New North Carolinians, Guidance for Engaging Immigrant and Refugee Communities and Research, and that's a link over here. These communities are often low income and disadvantaged and the research process should benefit them and not further burden them. The guidelines are a set of reflection, discussion and action points for researchers considering conducting research with diverse communities. And I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to all of the presenters for your outstanding presentations. My name is Tatiana Shippey. I am an associate professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. And for the next um, eight or so minutes, I will serve as the moderator for our discussion today. I consider myself a community engaged researcher. I am honored to have received uh, University of Minnesota President's Community Engaged Scholar Award. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it's been heartening to see growing recognition in a field of aging and public health for the importance of community engaged research. Just a couple of highlights that I wanted to um, share from listening to you and learning from, from your presentations today. Jenny, thank you so much for the important work that you and your organization is doing. I really love the importance of, that you placed on the feeling of dignity, autonomy, and choice for older adults. I love the free shopping program. I think this can be like an intervention that could be tested, right? The work that you shared today, I think is provides a lot of opportunities for researchers, uh, you know, to adopt the work that you already know is working <laughs> because you are doing this work, you know, in everyday life. The importance of person-centered care, which I think your program really uh, exemplifies and sense of belonging, belonging, sense of home and dignity. So even though we started by when we had a little discussion prep time, you said you didn't have all of those other degrees behind your name. In fact, what is expertise? I think we're here all talking about what does expertise mean? And uh, as I said, I've learned a lot from your pres presentation. I believe it shows the expertise that we need to learn as researchers with the different you know, titles behind our name on what person-centered care looks like. And doctors Morrison and Suda, thank you so much for your presentation. Much remains to be said in the short amount of time I have, but I really appreciate your thoughtful overview of CBPR and really Dr. Suda, your call to action for us as gerontologists that maybe many other fields, I would say maybe public health, you know, community um, uh, epidemiology have done a lot with CBPR, uh, obviously anthropology and sociology, and we share those backgrounds, but it'd be helpful, I think, and maybe this interest group can do this work to see a more systematic call for action for us as gerontologists in what evidence looks like in CBPR, including systematic review on in this field. 
Uh, I would also say really appreciate your focus on co-partnership, co-creation, empowerment, which are so important for community building. I love that focus on a common destination in the work that you're doing with your community partners. So the question I'd like to pose for all of you, and I hope that our participants will pose questions in chat or maybe comments is having doing this work, Jenny, for you doing this work as what you do in a community and doctors Morrison and Suda as researchers who partner with communities, what do you see as the future of community engaged research? What do you see as you know, gerontology's role in really speaking up, advocating, bringing funding, your comment about funding to, to do this work well? Who wants to go first, Sharon or Jenny? Uh, I can speak just from a, yeah, from our perspective. Uh, one of the issues that we come up against uh, often in terms of funding is a lot of the research um, is geared toward, because I work in uh, populations around homelessness, it's just, just around homelessness in general. And I, and I appreciated what both of you said about um, with newcomers and refugees, it doesn't separate out older adults and, and their needs and being more unique. And so that's what we're, we're as community members right now trying to actually create that data for um, funders, um, but it's being, as I said before, seniors get lumped in um, to the general population and they have different needs. So um, as, as a community support agency, I would say it would be so helpful to have more um, data around the specific needs. And also because our funding goes towards general support services, again, as I said, we had to figure out why, why was this a disconnect between actually the services and accessing the services what was stopping them from accessing the services and only because we got to know them personally we realized oh like that's against their culture or their pride to receive this um, charity or to look dependent upon somebody else um, and so I think that would be really helpful for us to be able to present to our funders to say this is this is why this is important and this is why this will actually help us be more economic um, if we were able to fund this. And, and I didn't mention this before, but um, what we often see, and we don't have concrete data to show, is we prevent older adults from going into higher care, into long-term care, into assisted living. Uh, for, for months or years longer, they're able to remain in their own housing because of our support services. And in, and in our province, um, going into higher care um, costs around uh, $800 per day, hospitalization is over $1,000 per day, our services cost $8 per day. And so just looking at the economics of that, as well as the autonomy and the dignity and everything else that goes along with it, uh, homelessness is $245 per day uh, is what it costs our government. So that's what okay. that's what so clearly helpful. why we need to do these partnerships because exactly. it's supposed to be mutually beneficial and mm -hmm. the evaluation would provide the evidence for you. Yeah, please. Uh, um, and share. So, so I agree. First of all, just academia is a strange bird, and, and then I'll just say it here because the thing that um, really strengthens, and I'm looking at a question about implementation, mm -hmm. and um, we, pe this is what you're doing, Jenny. This is what we do when we work with communities, and they guide us, take our hands, and guide us through their life their lived experiences. We bring tools from research to help them get data to make the case. And then CBPR has this big reciprocity piece. So it means whatever we've discovered and sat down and come up with, we have the flexibility to implement. And so with what we've seen with the Mountain Yard Dega Association and their youth arm, which emerged as a Mountain Yard American organization, they have now successfully built capacity to say, make some noise and say, no, your programs don't serve us this way. And this is how it's going, it works. And so for example, Kate B. Reynolds, a big foundation, which is unusual, gave them funding. So they started out with 100,000 and KB Reynolds said, you obviously in your proposal know how to handle crisis or these kinds of issues. So COVID should be right up your wheelhouse and use your protocols, use what you know works, best practices. And they've done such a good job that when they, 
then they're wrapping up. KB Reynolds says, we've got another couple grand. We'll be happy to give it to you because your outcomes are stellar more than any other research. And that's because of the partnership and working with. So when, when we talk about implementation and we work with um, communities, they are able to head us off if we're heading in the wrong direction. So there's not a lot of ways. There's a lot of reality checking. And if you think about working with the wisdom of older adults, which is what Sudan and I spent some hours talking about, one of the things that came out of that is giving older adults from an underserved community voice in this, in particularly a climate, political climate that for a few years was anti-refugee, anti-immigrant. And they were able to begin to organize in a different way without feeling without fear, um, but also with confidence that they could say what they had to say and get what they had to do for their communities. So they addressed homelessness. They addressed food insecurity in strategies that were efficient um, and engaged a lot of their community in the process. Thank you so much, Dr. Morrison. And I saw that several questions were posted in chat and Q&A and you are addressing them. So thank you for doing that. I know Carrie asked me to be done right around 1048. So I think we are just on time and thank you again for the presenters. I'll hand it off to you, Carrie. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Um, thanks to all of our presenters and Tatiana for um, being here as well. Um, I wish we had more time to spend in dialogue, um, to meet and talk more about your research and your work at Holway House. Um, we can continue the conversation and GSA Connect and in the future, um, we have some email addresses in the chat there. And to the questions that came up, I just took the opportunity to place um, an attachment in the chat and that will give you um, an overview of our upcoming webinars over the summer. We will be focusing our journal club around one of the questions that came up today, which is um, research uh, implementation and community engaged research, collaboration and community engaged research, and also participation. So those will happen monthly in July, August, and September. Um, and then before that, uh, each of those meetings in July, August, and September, those journal clubs, um, we're going to have some articles and some readings to chew into. But we're also making a peer mentoring space one hour before those meetings. And so that people can show up at 3 p.m. and talk to others, like-minded individuals that can offer that um, peer mentoring um, that is needed in this kind of work. I know it's been uh, valuable to me and something that's uh, gravely needed. So I look forward to more of this and more engaged uh, in communication and dialogue around this topic that we clearly all share um, an interest in. So thank you. Uh, we have a 50 minute limit and that ends our session. Thank you to all of our speakers again and everybody for attending and the gift of your time. We appreciate thank it. Thank you for this opportunity. We really appreciate it. If anybody's out there is thinking of what they want to write a paper or, you know, build their research portfolio, please write a review of CBPR methods in gerontology and I'd be happy to cite you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, so thank you everyone. Thank, thank you. you.